Puppetry generally isn't considered a very well-respected art form. Outside of the theater world, the only mainstream success stories we really have are all from the Jim Henson Company, still sticking around, still trying to make puppets a valued aspect of film and television. They've done a lot of good work in the past, but they're still on a perpetual struggle to stay relevant. Today, even if you do get amazing at puppeteering, it's not like the world is going to give you many creative opportunities to showcase that talent. That's because, truthfully, most people don't want to watch stuff with puppets in it anymore. Whatever space they once occupied in popular culture, well, it's currently gone. And sure, there have been some extremely rare exceptions to this. I and many others really enjoyed that Dark Crystal Age of Resistance show that they made. I think the dark fantasy vibe and the fact that the show committed so hard to making almost everything practically created this weird alien environment that you couldn't really get any other way. This commitment also avoided the biggest issue that has so often plagued modern puppetry, the Uncanny Valley. Lots of folks, including myself, are just creeped out by these things, but by keeping the setting fantastical and foreign while also avoiding any close association to other more human-like physical attributes, nothing felt creepy in the wrong way in the Dark Crystal series. The things that were meant to be the most threatening and villainous were depicted by actors in costumes giving them distinct human-like movements. But the heroes were all small puppets that more often than not obeyed puppet logic for their movements. This effectively turned the Uncanny Valley into their favor, and I think it's something that any other modern show the Jim Henson Company creates could stand to remember. Puppets aren't seen by the public as they once were. The Muppets and the citizens of Sesame Street just aren't big deals anymore. They're now just another old property riding the nostalgia wave into the future, showing up on television sets for a generation that didn't grow up with them and doesn't understand what the big deal is. Dark Crystal Age of Resistance was poised to sit in that exact same spot, but with a passion and sheer creativity that was brought to that project from creators Jeffrey Addis and Will Matthews, it became one of the few modern puppet-based projects that actually got some positive reception. Realistically, though, the show was still an expensive prequel series to a cult classic fantasy movie from the early 80s that had initially bombed. There was almost no way it was going to survive past one season. And especially not with Netflix calling the shots. In fact, it's difficult to imagine anyone being able to successfully navigate using puppets in the modern world and actually having something to show for it. Which is why it is just so impressive to me that the makers of Don't Hug Me, I'm Scared have managed to do exactly that. Series creators Becky Sloan, Baker Terry, and Joe Pelling have spent 12 years building this creepy little kid show parody into something far bigger and far more substantial, and all while maintaining complete control over their own intellectual property. Getting to see them take what was first a web series and develop it into the TV series that it is today has been a long but very fulfilling journey. And I think a lot of credit should be given to these artists for managing to accomplish what they did. Through the series, you can see them each grow and improve in their respective fields, and it's been a rare joy to witness people hone their craft like this. It's an even rarer joy to see those developed skills actually being used for something great. Like I said, in terms of traditional puppetry, the only mainstream successes we've had in the last couple of decades have been either made by the Jim Henson Company, or these three Brits. And the Jim Henson Company has the ghost of Jim Henson backing them up. Sloan, Terry, and Pelling were just some college students who happened to make a short film in their free time that happened to get popular. Sloan made the puppets, Terry did the song, and Pelling did the directing. They took the initiative and turned the series into what it is today. And I think there's a lot of value in examining how exactly they managed to pull that off. Come on guys, let's get creative! In the early days of YouTube, and also my own youth, the site was full of spooky shit that was deliberately designed by children to freak out other slightly younger children who were also using the platform with them. These came in a million different forms, but most of them were creepypastas. They would either get popular and die out in obscurity after a period of time like Ben Drowned or Siren Head, 
or go on to become increasingly overexposed until more mainstream sources took notice of them and everyone stopped caring like what happened with Slenderman and what is probably going to happen with the backrooms. But in this ancient age of YouTube, the original Don't Hug Me, I'm Scared short film sat pretty comfortably. It was almost perfectly designed for this type of early YouTube audience. That original short film was something to freak you out and then be passed along to your friends so you could watch them be freaked out by it too. Easy fodder for early reaction channels. Draw them in with something simple, and then abruptly or slowly over the course of the video, reveal more and more sinister edges until you've ramped up for one big jump scare in the climax. The original Don't Hug Me I'm Scared video is practically this in slow motion. A normal lesson slash song about creativity gets more and more aggressive and deranged until it blows up into a cacophony of horrifying thoughtless madness. It was no surprise that the video would immediately blow up like it did, but Sloane, Terry, and Pelling had just made it on a whim, and I don't think when they originally conceived of the idea, they had put very much thought into the specifics or considered how to future-proof the concept for any longevity. That's not to say there isn't some perspective or goal with the first video, it's not all random madness. It's just presented very flat and direct, especially in considering with what they would follow this up with. Actually, now, looking back past my younger, traumatized memories, it is shocking how cheap and simple that first episode really is. In essence, it's just a normal puppet show song for most of the video, until the music changes and the puppets start spazzing out. The brief hints that something isn't quite right that pop up before the music shifts are less threatening and scary than they are just flat-out weird and nonsensical. To me, this is what gave that first video, and the subsequent web series, its most distinct creative voice. It's not the gore and the out-of-tune music, it's the black oil falling on the clown painting completely silently, and the ridiculous phrase, green is not a creative color, spoken with so much assuredness. Those were the real highlights of the first episode, because it pointed not to some basic horror convention that you could have got from a bunch of other creepypastas, but this more disturbed, strangely confrontational space where everything is so uncomfortable and awkward. Exactly the opposite type of environment a good kid show would ever want to produce. That first video makes an impact not because it's necessarily scary, but because it gives off this horribly unnerving feeling that something scary could occur at any possible moment. Even as it builds to the frenzy at the end, you get this sense that something far worse than what actually happens is going to end up happening. To me, this is the cornerstone of creating great tension, and it is something that Don't Hug Me I'm Scared excels at routinely better than anything else it does. It makes the whole short film feel a little off balance, like it's a song for a kid's show that was created by aliens who've never seen a kid's show in their life before. And in this regard, the natural uncanny valiness of the puppets is made into a huge benefit. What better way to present this deranged vision of children's media than a well-intended puppet show that somehow goes off the rails until it becomes a full-on horror, where at the end of the episode the exact opposite of the intended lesson is what's ultimately learned. Now let's all agree to never be creative again. The viral attention worked out well for the trio of young artists, as the short film was played at both Sundance and South by Southwest. It was a huge opportunity for them, and at the time it did give at least Becky and Joe a bit of notoriety in the entertainment world. They got some work animating a Tame Impala video, as well as an Unknown Moral Orchestra video. Joe made some shorts for Adult Swim, and Becky made a completely earnest song about baby CPR for St. John's Ambulances, if you can believe that. It's pretty interesting to watch any of them now. See how each of these people discovered their own style, and the shadows of it you can see in their later projects. The group also originally had plans to continue the Don't Hug Me I'm Scared idea further, but dropped that and seriously scaled back their efforts while making the first video. But now, they had this window of opportunity, and it was time to take advantage of it. So, after accepting a commission from Channel 4, they went ahead and created another Don't Hug Me, I'm Scared short film. This sophomore effort proved to be not just a huge improvement on its predecessor, but ended up taking a lot of steps in setting up what exactly Don't Hug Me, I'm Scared was going to be. That first episode on creativity, which was made two years before the episode on time, really only established the basic concept, 
a teacher shows up and sings a song that progressively gets more fucked up and illogical until it bears absolutely no resemblance to anything that would ever appear on an actual children's show. In many ways, it feels like this was the core idea going into the second episode, and so Sloane, Terry, and Pelling built on the premise from there. Now with a bigger budget and better equipment, the episode can play out longer, in this case actually offering a bit more of a narrative, whereas the first episode was pretty one-note in execution. Just watching this sequel, you can see the differences. Like how Tony the Clock becomes visibly more frustrated with the group and starts directly threatening them for asking more probing questions about the nature of time. The big final jump into outright horror at the end only happens when one of the puppets actually starts making sense. It lays things out clear and bare. This children's show is no place for learning and no place for asking questions. Just pay attention, follow along, and trust the adult in the room implicitly. According to Sloane, Terry, and Pelling, the success of these first two episodes gave them a foot in the door for a lot of mainstream networks and producers, each of which wanted to commission more episodes like Channel 4 had done. But the trio were turned off by this. They wanted to maintain ownership and control of their own idea. So Becky, Baker, and Joe decided to do it on their own, creating a Kickstarter to fund a couple more episodes which hopefully would make up a full series. They needed $96,000 for four episodes, or more, which would be released three months apart. And yeah, ultimately, that production turnaround proved to be a little more ambitious than they could provide, but the trio did still get the money they needed, ending the Kickstarter with just over $100,000. And as a bonus for the backers, they even made these weird little videos on old cameras depicting the different puppets being held up for ransom. To me... This is what truly begins Don't Hug Me, I'm Scared's journey as a serialized web series. The first episode was a proof of concept, and the second episode may as well have been just an extension of that initial proof of concept, but now the three had the time and the resources and the attention to create something far bigger than what they had done before. These weird little ransom videos, which were so effective and terrifying, was proof that they had a lot more in store for these three puppets. Everything had seemed perfectly aligned for the third episode of Don't Hug Me, I'm Scared to be yet another in a long line of successes. But it wasn't. As many have pointed out before, Don't Hug Me, I'm Scared 3 is very much the black sheep of the web series. So, what happened? Why didn't this one land like the others? It definitely follows through with the expectations set up from the last, it still serves as an escalation on what came before. The sets are much bigger and much more elaborate. There's better production value all around and a ton of new puppets. One's even this giant talking head thing that probably took hours to build, and these mental bastards burn it to the ground in the end credits. In a lot of ways, it feels like this was what everyone was looking for. But even with all this going for it, it's hard not to feel like Don't Hug Me, I'm Scared 3 is missing some of what made those other episodes special. I believe this can be explained by some of the ways Sloane, Terry, and Pelling chose to further develop the concept of DHMIS. This episode was the first after the Kickstarter, and it definitely shows. This upping of resources allowed the crew to try out a lot of new things, and I think in doing so they got a little narrow-minded with the premise. We can see this in the framing of the whole episode around something as traditional and normal as a sex cult. And that might be a weird thing to say, but choosing a deranged sex cult that teaches the exact wrong lesson about love just feels like too normal a threat for the Don't Hug Me, I'm Scared crew to go up against. The fear that's generated from this scenario is too close to an actual scenario that could happen in reality. Time and creativity were approached as much more abstract concepts, and the gap between how the teachers were incorrectly presenting the subject versus what the subject actually was, was a lot more vast. You couldn't tell what the agenda was with Tony or the sketchbook because they were just too damn weird. But the butterfly named Shrignold is so obvious from the very start. It makes this episode feel like the only one out of the original web series that moves away from the whole teacher concept as a whole, and it definitely falters because of this. Things feel more at home when the song is insane, surreal, and impossible to grasp. 
But even outside of that particular angle, it doesn't help that the episode is just not nearly as scary as any of the others in the web series. It might be the funniest out of the six originals. You can definitely see how a lot of the TV show's love for non-sequiturs probably originated here. There's really great moments like the story of Michael, the ugliest boy in town, or the many weird Christian fundamentalist undertones that the song segues into. But as much as I like these moments, they still feel a little too front-facing, a little too loud for the more evasive nature that the other episodes possessed. The humor and tone as well just feels too outspoken to create effective scares. The best example I can think of this is through the introduction of Malcolm, the King of Love. The second the words, and we all worship our king, are said, the song finally takes that hard turn into aggressive, threatening mode like the other episodes did. And yet it still doesn't commit as far as those ones. It's building to it nicely, and when it feels like it's just about to finally pass over that last hump and transition into pure chaos and madness, the episode stops. Yellow wakes up, and things come to an end after we hear the very first pesky bee. Pesky bee? Pesky bee? Pesky bee? Pesky bee? In many ways, episode 3 was a departure. It tried some new things out, and some of them worked, and some of them didn't. The episode did, however, show that the more grounded in actual space and time that Don't Hug Me, I'm Scared is, the less interesting it can be to watch. And look, I don't hate the episode or anything, but it does feel like the weakest one out of the bunch. It's the one most at odds with the goals of the rest of the series, TV show and all. Becky Sloan, Terry Baker, and Joe Pelling were definitely listening to the reactions, though, because the following episode very clearly veers back into the formula that was set up from the first two episodes. I think it's also the episode where the trio first started to really put consideration into how they were going to tell this thing as an actual story, and of course, how they were going to ultimately end it. Really, it is pretty impressive that they corrected course so quickly and absolutely. Not only does the fourth episode about computers confidently rework the series back to where it started, but it also learns a lot from the past mistakes and successes of the previous three episodes, all to create something even better. Starting off the fourth one is this opening chat between the puppets, this really slow, stilted thing that just gets worse once Colin the computer arrives. He brings us comfortably back in gear, watching a kid's show falling apart in real time. They aren't even receiving the correct lesson of the day in this one. Colin just usurps the globe's position, and they all just go along with it. It's stiff and awkward, and it puts the tone of the show right back where it belongs, in the comfortable valley of the uncanny. It's odd, though. Aside from screaming, don't touch me, Colin doesn't really seem like much of a threat to the puppets this time around. Instead, it just seems like he doesn't actually have any idea what he's talking about. Every time he is faced with a question, he pauses, kind of like a slow computer, and then doesn't really answer the question. Or if he does, it's just a very clearly incorrect response. Doing this again helps restructure the show back in that surreal space, where nothing makes sense and everything is either really, really stupid or really, really terrifying. It's a very difficult balance to maintain, but in this episode, they pull it off exceptionally well. Wait, what? This is also the episode where I really started to notice the amount of improvements that each of Don't Hug Me, I'm Scared's three creators have made. You can pretty clearly see how Sloane has naturally made each puppet more complex with each iteration of the series. In addition, as the show goes on, Becky managed to include a pretty wide range of different types of puppets that were controlled in some pretty inventive ways. And I think it's probably pretty difficult to do this over and over again in a way that still falls in line with the felt cartoon aesthetic that the series had established by this point. Looking at the behind the scenes, it's crazy to see how creative she got with animating certain movements in this world. And it's a testament to the directing of these shorts that all these crazy ideas get translated so well to screen. Joe definitely grew a lot as a director the more the series went on. The creativity episode is just a bunch of flat shots, more or less. But you can really see Joe become a lot more confident as a filmmaker. There's bigger risks taken. The camera starts being placed on all these uncomfortable sudden POV angles. The lighting and mood of scenes abruptly shifts between shots. And there's all these small details that are placed so carefully in the background that are just as quickly cut away from without further explanation. It all looks just so much more chaotic than it did before. 
and yet it only looks that way because of the insane level of coordination that needs to be pulled off every single time. And yet, Joe consistently does it. Finally, there's Baker Terry, whose role I feel is at times undermined in the series, as he isn't as prominently featured as the other two. But being the one creating most of the songs and doing most of the acting, he really does shine in the later episodes once he's allowed to imbue some character and personality in these puppets, and also take some bigger swings with the song lyrics. Likewise, he's also one of the writers of the series, even though it does seem like a group effort. In that regard, the show has definitely improved. No longer are they just simply gesturing at horror and not safe for children scenarios, it feels like now the creators have a much better handle on their beast and seem to understand what should or shouldn't happen in the series. Don't Hug Me, I'm Scared is at its best when it is equal parts horrifying and funny and absurd. It creates this feeling bigger than any traditional horror film or traditional comedy could create, a sense of being completely lost. Unsure if you should cry because of how unnerving everything is, or laugh because of how ridiculous everything is. Seeing them bounce back from the third episode was incredible to witness. And the spectacular fourth just paved the way for Don't Hug Me, I'm Scared's next and finest outing. The fifth episode. My personal favorite episode, and in many ways a culmination of everything these artists have learned up to this point. Let's get healthy now! Episode 4 changed things up a bit by being the first episode where any of the main characters actually responded to the madness around them in any realistic way. It made things a bit more disturbed and edgy, but it also created the first actual shift in the show's established formula. When Episode 5 begins, Red Guy is gone, and everything feels so strange and off-base even for a show that's usually pretty strange and off-base. The other puppets even point this out directly. And this is the first way Episode 5 stands out. Before this, the main characters never really responded to the teachers as you think they should. They were just mainly passive observers or occasional victims. Red Guy seemed to be the most normal out of the bunch, but all he ever did was ask basic questions about his surroundings. Like, it never seemed like he cared all that much about what was happening. He didn't care about getting sucked into a digital world by a mad artificial intelligence. But in this episode, Duck Guy, from beginning to end, acts like he knows he is about to be murdered. And it's this little shift, in conjunction with Red Guy's absence, that sets the stage for this absolute nightmare to begin. The original formula of setting up a normal lesson for kids, and then gradually making it creepy, has just about been perfected. Everything from the start of the episode to the episode's end feels carefully calibrated to make this big, terrifying, nonsense song about nutritional food hit harder than any other song has before. There's so much in here that they do so expertly. The way Duck is so anxious the entire time. The fact that these much larger characters keep grabbing at him and holding on to him throughout. The fact that the teachers keep ignoring what he's saying. The phone call that cuts through the song abruptly. The many sudden handheld shots, the weird bread loaf who drops the spoon at the beginning, and of course the constant aggression that keeps being directed at Duck and then just as quickly dropped without reason. It creates this feeling of incomprehensible powerlessness. And that's what comes across so triumphantly in this episode. It really gives you a flight or fight response, never being sure exactly how things are going to turn out but dreading every single second that passes. There's also some pretty powerful imagery that ends out the episode, too. I think the image of a goofy can with a goofy, giggly, dumb guy voice eating the extremely anatomically realistic innards of a tortured mallard puppet is about just as perfect a summation of what Don't Hug Me, I'm Scared is all about as you could possibly get. Which, in many ways, it was. I feel this episode was when they had taken the formula just about as far as they could for this format. They'd brought all of their collective skills to the table, and they achieved this wonderful peak. All that was left to do was finish the web series. No! The final episode of the original web series does what it can to put things to bed. After the huge slam dunk that was healthy eating, though, it does feel like this one struggles to live up to the hype. 
This final episode has the burden of wrapping everything up in a way that's acceptable for many, many, many people with many, many, many different ideas about what this series is actually supposed to be about. It was a task made so much more difficult because of how the vague mystery-oriented aspects of the web series so clearly flew in the face of offering a resolute, satisfying conclusion. There was always going to be some sense of disappointment in ending this because the possibilities had become endless. The final we did get, though, I think manages to close things out about as well as they could at this point. Episode 5 was such a huge horror high that Episode 6 doesn't even really try to match it. Instead, it goes for a maximalist approach, throwing a whole bunch of teachers and songs back to back to back, and also finally offering something a little more concrete in regards to an actual explanation about what the hell is happening here. To me, Roy's reintroduction is a nice villainous light at the end of the tunnel. And I think seeing him at the other side controlling the terror that was being inflicted on his own son really put a lot of things into perspective, for me at least. Not narrative-wise, if you can even say that this show has a narrative, but in regards to the core thematic ideas that Sloane, Terry, and Pelling were trying to get across with this piece. To me, Roy was representative of the types of abusive stage parents who throw their kids out into these overproduced, underthought-out kid shows and then simply sit back and let them suffer for their own financial benefit. The fact that Roy is always credited as financially backing the show at the end of the episode also lends to this understanding. DHMIS always had this very meta angle to it, and there was always some sense that we were watching a show within a show, or something approximating that. Altogether, though, these ideas of horrible teacher figures and wrong-minded lessons learned, and the blatant abuse of children, points to the series being chiefly about, at least to me, how kids can get traumatized by the things that we teach them. Especially when we don't care about the value of what's being taught, or who's the person teaching it. How media can amplify this power until it becomes something horrendous and unnatural. How one father can ruin his child's life so much that he actively doesn't even want to learn anything about anything anymore. His natural, inquisitive, curious mind is destroyed, and now what's left is just this fearful, kicked dog. No, I don't want to know. I, I don't want to know how to have dreams. No, no. For a series finale, I think it did its job pretty damn well. Because Don't Hug Me, I'm Scared always had an odd history with its story. I definitely don't believe that much was planned from the start, and I think that the ideas of an actual narrative were only really filled in starting from about episode four. All the characters being picked off one at a time was a pretty fun development, though. And the final shot of the characters, now sporting their favorite color, is about as quick and clean a way to close out the story as you could ever want. The characters all suffered, and the state of children's television content is still not all what it should be, and we might all just be repeating the same evil cycle as we did before, but at least the characters get to look like their favorite color now, so no one is dashing their creative spirit anymore, if nothing else. What we got was ultimately what we got, but it did seem to be perfectly satisfying for the many theorists and Don't Hug Me, I'm Scared explained YouTube videos out there, which again feels like a colossal challenge that Sloane, Terry, and Pelling had to overcome, and I think they should get a lot more credit for landing the plane as deftly as they did, because a lot of people liked Don't Hug Me, I'm Scared. And when that web series was all over and it could be looked at from top to bottom, people started to come out with their own interpretations and theories about what this whole thing was actually about. And I'm of two minds about this, because on the one hand, I do truly love art that's made in this way. Art that so openly invites its audience to fill in the gaps for themselves. And I also love artists who take the David Lynch approach and don't bother offering an easy explanation for their projects. If you're making something abstract that by its very nature requires interpretation, it doesn't do you any good to just explain what all the pieces are. Why even make an abstract series in the first place if you're willing to just tell me exactly what you meant anyway? Providing a clear, direct, understandable statement would just ruin things, and it's good that the trio didn't fully reveal why any of this is actually happening or what it's supposed to mean. Abstract art can feel so personal because it's so reflexive and hard to grasp, so people usually attribute their own feelings and experiences to the art, 
even if there's not a lot of evidence within the text for this understanding. And just to be clear, I think that is great. I think it's a mark of genuine accomplishment that they've created something that speaks to so many people in so many different ways. I love watching these theory videos from other YouTubers and hearing what they thought about the series, or occasionally getting additional context for things I didn't know about, like how June 19, 1955 was when ads were allowed on British television after the passing of the Television Act in 1954. The prominence of that date and the meta-nature of the series certainly feels like that fact is important, and it's not something I would have learned if I hadn't watched some YouTube video. But, also, I do feel like the further you go down this side of YouTube, the more close-minded you can get. Because as subreddits and communities get built up, and popular theories start getting circulated, it stops being about what the art is trying to say and how it spoke to you as an individual, and instead becomes some game where people are trying to solve some vast, carefully constructed puzzle that only they can truly understand. Going down that route just turns the whole narrative into a long game of telephone where the future of the story is just more obfuscation for obfuscation's sake. It is such an incredibly destructive way to look at art. It makes me feel like people don't actually care about the series at all, they just want to win some imaginary internet scavenger hunt and brag to all their friends about how correct they were. And again, I want to stress that this isn't everyone. There is a very, very important distinction between providing your interpretation versus providing THE explanation. This is abstract art. It doesn't need a flat beat-by-beat -beat rundown because it's not really trying to tell a flat beat-by-beat -beat story. It doesn't feel like some grand puzzle box waiting to be solved, either. It feels like all the information they wanted to convey was shown through the six episodes that they produced. Really, I think a lot of the core ideas of the web series were expressed in the first two episodes, and everything since then has just been opportunities to tweak the formula. It should be pointed out that it wasn't even until the third episode that the trio had any sense that they were going to be capable of doing more than a couple of these things anyway. And I don't say that so I can dash anyone else's interpretation and declare it impossible to be true and only what I say is accurate because I'm the smart boy. Exactly the opposite, in fact. I want to hear what everyone else thinks about Don't Hug Me, I'm Scared. Because I love Don't Hug Me, I'm Scared. And I don't want those people talking about it being labeled factually incorrect or accused of not understanding the show because they didn't come to the same conclusion as the most popular theorist. I just mean that you should take every YouTube video with the words EXPLAINED at the end of the title with a grain of salt. Always remember to avoid those who act like there is one objective correct way to look at art, especially abstract art. Even MatPat at least ends every video saying, it's just a theory. Okay. To Sloan, Terry, and Pelling though, this would be of little consequence. They were already advancing into the next chapter of their career. And this came in the form of more short films for Adult Swim, and some general commercial work. Having finished the series, they were translating the skills they learned there for the first time into other venues. You might have even noticed their style of animation popping up during a trolley commercial or two in the last couple of years. However, none of this extra work would be nearly as noteworthy as what Sloan and Pelling ended up doing for Cartoon Network. Because in 2017, about a year after the web series ended, Sloan and Pelling were brought in as a sort of guest animators for one episode of The Amazing Adventures of Gumball. And what they made is pretty interesting, especially for fans of Don't Hug Me, I'm Scared, because they effectively created a PG-friendly adaptation of the web series. Watching it is a surreal, surreal experience, as a lot does end up getting translated without any real loss, horror included. Sure, the episode they made, entitled The Puppets, was on Gumball, and it's clear from the many, many weird digressions that that show took over the years that series creator Ben Bukele didn't really fret over freaking out kids every now and then. But still, it is kind of fascinating to see the two of them work backwards to create actual content for children that is based on their web show that was a satire about content for children. What does come across the clearest is how easily Sloan and Pelling's humor jived with the humor of Bukele's show. There's really nothing that mature about any of the jokes in DHMIS, and the ones that are, I feel, don't usually land very well. There are very few sexual references in the web series and in the TV show, 
but to my mind, they never really fit in with the rest of the jokes. Without that, the only thing actually missing from this PG don't hug me I'm scared is gore. And yeah, I'm sure it took them a lot of restraint to not fill that cake that comes apart with blood, guts, and organs. But even with that loss, it's not like the lack of gore makes the moment any less effective or any less befitting from the original series. Outside this, the song and episode are a nice bit of childhood trauma-inducing content, and it delivers the same sort of twisted nightmare logic that the two of them had perfected six times already. What's most interesting is that after they worked on the episode, Sloan and Pelling were additionally hired by Cartoon Network to use these puppets they made for a bunch of shorts. You can watch them right now on their YouTube page. And unlike the Gumball episodes, these shorts are made completely independently, with not even tonal connections to DHMIS. And all of it is specifically targeted for children, even more so than Gumball ever was. And it's definitely worth a watch because of this. If nothing else, it proves that Sloan and Pelling are just as capable at making a parody of children's content as they are at making actual children's content. Uh, there. I did it. Guys, the Gumball episode wouldn't be the end, however. Far from it as the trio had also spent their time after the series concluded seeking producers for a new project. This would be a full-on TV series based on the characters from Don't Hug Me, I'm Scared, a natural evolution from their previous project. And obviously, with the aforementioned mountain of success under their belt already, Sloan, Terry, and Pelling were quick to find their collaborators at Konico and Super Deluxe, two production companies that outwardly fit in well with DHMIS's brand. The three of them got to work on the show, creating a whole bunch of puppets and songs and brand new ideas. In the end, they had apparently finished three full 22-minute episodes for this new series, and they were getting ready to premiere the pilot at Sundance. Just like the original first short film had been screened in 2013, they were going to do it again for this new pilot in 2019. Preceding the festival, and for the first time since the web series finale, the Don't Hug Me, I'm Scared YouTube channel released a mysterious trailer called Wakey Wakey which ultimately would come to be the only good footage we would ever get of the pilot that the three of them made with Conoco and Super Deluxe. The rest of the episodes would never be shown to the public, everybody went silent, and the whole thing was presumably shut down. What? Where's... Where's mine? After the fact, there were many explanations for why this happened, but at the time it was all pretty unknown for everyone. The trailer came out, and the pilot screened at Sundance, and then it was just nothing for years and years. It really felt like the whole project was just scrapped, and we wouldn't be seeing any more of Becky Sloan or Baker Terry or Joe Pelling ever again. Just one of many artists made famous on the internet and then immediately chewed up and spat out by the entertainment industry. Today, we have a better understanding of what happened. The trio have discussed the situation since then, and to me it seems like this potential new series coming apart came half from Super Deluxe shutting down and half from a personal dissatisfaction with the final product that they had made. There was also apparently a lot of complications facing them because of COVID-19, but at the same time, the other TV series was still created and filmed during the COVID-19 pandemic, so who really knows what was going on. Whatever it was, it was enough of an issue that it turned them off from the whole idea altogether. But now they were free of their obligation, as Konico also kind of sort of went out of business too. So the three artists went back to their original commissioners, all the way from the second episode, Channel 4. Channel 4 made a deal for a new TV series in 2020, completely disassociated from the one that the trio had made with the Americans. However, before we can talk about that and the decisions that that show made, let's try to understand what about this pilot made the trio turn away from the concept. Why didn't Clay Hill work? Right off the bat, I will admit that due to the lack of available information on the subject, and because of the quality of the footage that is currently available on the internet, I have a very, very, very imperfect view of what this series could have been. About three quarters of the pilot episode, entitled Clay Hill, are available to watch in some form or another on YouTube. Alongside this, the full synopsis of the pilot has also been detailed out. I will be primarily using this material and what I'm able to glean from the differences between this show and its setting and the setting of the actual Channel 4 Don't Hug Me, I'm Scared show 
to explain how and why I think the trio made the changes that they made. And look, I know that isn't ideal, but I think it still is a worthwhile exercise in learning how we got to the final series that we got. There's so much that's unique about Clay Hill that makes it stand out against all the other episodes in this weird semi-canon. Like, Clay Hill doesn't really feel like an adaptation of the web series at all. It doesn't even feel like it's going for the same thing. That's the first clear difference from the two TV shows that you'll likely notice. And it's not just because of the new setting, or the increased number of characters, or the, as has been stated by the creators themselves, lack of claustrophobia. It's because this pilot doesn't feel like a parody or a satire of a kid's show. It feels more like a weird, fucked-up show for adults that just so happens to have puppets in it. The gore and unchild-friendly subject matter aren't really commenting on or used in service of some greater goal. It's all just kind of there. Only novel because it's placing welcoming cartoon characters next to something gross and violent. In this regard, the pilot loses so much of the web series energy, and at its worst can come off like a happy Tree Friends clone. We've lost the entire meta aspect of the narrative that we usually rely on. There's no subversion in the Clay Hill pilot. There's no twist or immediate sense that it's trying to get at something bigger thematically. It's just missing that core idea that grounds the whole premise. If you go all the way back to the very first episode of the web series, there is that huge turning point with the black oil falling on the clown painting, which marks the transition from kids' show to terrifying nightmare dance macabre. The Clay Hill pilot has something similar, but its first ominous moment comes when the song just cuts to this pie made out of viscera only a few seconds in. It even has a whole close-up and everything. And even though it doesn't linger, it is still so bold and self-evident that it kind of immediately steps on the tension that was being built up. It seems much more naturally for the show to make the shift once they get to the mayor's house and notice he's missing. Pacing like that feels so misunderstood and ineffective, and this isn't the only undeliberate awkward moment in the Clayhill pilot. There's also the general humor and timing of the jokes that just keep not landing. If you watch the footage that was surreptitiously recorded during the Sundance screening, you can hear the audience not really giving a lot of moments in the episode the reaction that it seems the pilot is going for. And that's a big problem. Before, when the show was angling for the David Lynch surreal horror vibe, it worked. But now that things are a lot more grounded, it just doesn't fit. The structure of the children's show format that was established from the web series gave it this undercurrent that everything that was happening was kind of a joke in and of itself, because obviously none of this should be happening to characters who look like they belong on Sesame Street. But even putting the goals of the original and future series aside for a moment, when the Clayhill pilot is judged by its own merits, the episode still doesn't really amount to much. Joe Pelling made some comments about how this potential series was angling to have more political commentary, in the vein of South Park, and that this was one of the reasons that they were shutting it down, because it would get dated because South Park gets made in one week, and that's not really a luxury they can afford with the show they want to make. However, unless he was referring to the other two episodes they made, I gotta say I really don't see it in Clay Hill. The security story they go with doesn't feel all that pointed, or even all that contemporary. In fact, you could probably easily translate the same story beats into an episode of the Channel 4 Don't Hug Me, I'm Scared show, and not even have to change anything. The episodes on jobs and electricity are actually kind of similar already. Also, the ideas surrounding security as presented in that episode really aren't any more complicated than what would be featured in a normal kids' cartoon show. Gore aside, of course. And then there's this subplot about fizzy milk, but it's such a lazy, barely-there counterpoint that it really isn't even worth mentioning at all. I don't even agree that this episode is really that politically minded. Certainly not any more than the previous or the subsequent series that they made. If the problem exists, it's not here. It's not because the puppets got too political. But if I could offer one other suggestion, maybe the problem is instead that the Don't Hug Me I'm Scared brand doesn't feel like it should be used for anything this direct. There is a lot of political positions and opinions you can glean from both the Channel 4 TV show and the web series, but those shows go about it entirely differently. 
Clay Hill feels like it's talking straight to the audience, in a very I learned something today South Park model. And it really just makes the whole thing less interesting and less narratively substantial. But more than any of that, it just doesn't feel like we should be seeing these characters doing these things like this in this way. The story being told doesn't suit our understanding of them. And maybe if instead it had been made with different puppets, Clayhill could have escaped from the web series Shadow and found its own path. That's the big problem with the pilot. It doesn't know what it wants to be or what it's going for. It clearly isn't trying to be the original web series, but it really isn't working hard enough to be something different either. It feels like at this stage Sloan, Terry, and Pelling were unsure about how they want to extend their series onward, or if they even want to do that at all. Had they stuck with the Clay Hill idea, I think it could only have succeeded by going in a wildly different direction than anything else the trio have made. But still, I think it could have worked. As much as I have criticized this pilot that I will remind I didn't even get to see all the way through, I can see a lot of potential for this series. There's many moments that still stick out in my memory, like this one quick little snap to a very real, very not felt forest in the middle of the episode. I can't help but wonder what the hell that was all about. Or the insane song that Mayor Pigface sings to his logs. Or how the events of the episode seemingly take place over ten years' time. There are aspects of Clay Hill, however small, that point to a possible bright future for this series. Almost every show needs to find its footing, and there is nothing that I saw from this pilot that feels like a full-on deal-breaker. Nothing that would turn me away from watching the next episode. But in the face of the actual TV show that we did get, this pilot can't help but come off as a little bit disappointing. And maybe that's exactly how we should feel about Clay Hill. Sloan, Terry, and Pelling never released this pilot or the other episodes, and they probably could have. Leaving it behind, however, and letting it rest as an important stepping stone in their journey is probably a better spot for it in history anyway. The potential that was there within the Clay Hill idea could have been fostered, but a good artist should understand what's working about their project and what isn't, and respond from there based on the situation they're in. It probably wasn't a very easy or initially very prudent choice to make. Deciding to scrap this whole series and all they had built for it, save for like a few extra props and puppets, must have been daunting. But I gotta hand it to them for having the guts to do it. Throwing out years of work that's already finished because you're personally unsatisfied with it is a level of commitment to your craft that really isn't seen a lot of nowadays. It speaks to the mindsets of artists who actually have a stake in making sure their work is as good as it possibly can be. It is fucking crazy, and I can't believe they did it. Thankfully, though, it did turn out okay for them. Because if Clay Hill had to die for the Channel 4 series to live, then I suppose it might have been worth it in the end. Well, I'm sorry, that place doesn't exist anymore. What? Well, what happened to it? Just shriveled up, I reckon. Which finally brings us to the TV series. The peak. The magnum opus. The wonderful, amazing end result of all the work these three psychos have been putting in for over a decade. What they had made before was always enjoyable and usually pretty engaging, especially for what essentially amounted to a music video. But what they've done with Channel 4 might honestly be one of my new favorite shows. I absolutely fucking love the TV series. It is bold and unique and it builds on everything that has come before while also trying out plenty of new things. And all just works together so cohesively. In my eyes, it's a colossal triumph, and it kind of blows me away how good it all turned out. I'm not used to things ending up so well. Even with my admiration for the web series, I didn't think that Sloane, Terry, and Pelling had it in them. Or that the Don't Hug Me, I'm Scared format could or would ever be used to make something so captivating, but the trio just frickin' nailed it. And I couldn't be happier that I was proven wrong, and the Clay Hill trailer wasn't the last we heard of them. There has been unending terrible news for the world of animation lately. Like in the year 2022, was there ever really any good news to hear about for animators or fans of animation? Not really. But here was this show. This one crazy, amazing six-episode series that was halfway between Wonder Shows and halfway between The Shivering Truth and was entirely everything I could have ever wanted. Just a 
fucking great job all around. Well done, guys. Hey, wow, I didn't like that. Oh. Much like the web series, the Channel 4 TV series, also titled Don't Hug Me, I'm Scared, features the same basic formula of a messed up puppet show that slowly morphs into a messed up horror show. We watch as a red guy, a green duck, a yellow pig, and Stain Edwards the Forever Boy live together in the bottom floor of this one house and learn things together from singing teachers who show up at random. Sometimes they take them somewhere else and sometimes they just stay in the house, but always at some point the lesson fizzles out into nonsense. And the timeline for when this happens varies from episode to episode. In this way, the show can most easily be seen as an extension of what was already happening on the web series. Now, instead of just one musical segment plucked out of context, we're getting the whole episode that the original musical segment might have taken place in. At least, that certainly feels like the angle they're going for here. And that means now we aren't just framing this around a simple Lesson of the Day song anymore. Now it has to be framed around something more complex. Because we've got multiple songs, mixed media elements, new character dynamics, and a new story world with its own internal logic to worry about. The formula that was created in the original web series was never really made to be used for something as long as a 23 minute episode of television. But now they've got to use that formula for 23 minutes, six different times, all without feeling repetitive. This is the challenge that Sloan, Terry, and Pelling had to overcome, at least initially. How do you reintroduce this formula in a way that is both appealing to fans of the old web show, but also immediately palatable to your new audience? The show is, after all, airing on normal TV this time. Clayhill didn't even really try, but the Don't Hug Me, I'm Scared TV show does, and it does it well. So, how did it happen? How did the three of them do it? Well, what are we supposed to be doing now? Um... What? I would like to know what's meant to happen today. Well, first off, they eased up on the pacing and they let the tension of the episode flow out more naturally. They did the same formula again, just this time in even slower motion, not letting the chaos unfurl until we reach the final moments of the episode, and even then never letting it really unfurl in the same way twice. I don't know when it occurred to them, possibly after Clayhill, but I feel like there was definitely this concerted effort to take a step back and try to really focus in on every possible thing that worked about the original Don't Hug Me, I'm Scared web series. Then, figure out how to take those same ideas and translate them in a way that would match a normal TV show. If I had to make another guess, I'd say that the trio probably decided early on to take things right back to square one with the understanding that at its heart, the web series' main focus was on children's media specifically. The meta show within a show idea is one thing, but DHMIS was always banking on the inherent creepiness that a lot of people find in old TV shows for children. Whether it be a complicated nostalgic relationship or the simple wear of time on old styles of animation that make them look weird, there's always something inherently disturbing about children's entertainment for children who have long since become adults or, more likely, passed on. That's the mold that the Don't Hug Me, I'm Scared TV show definitely falls in. All of its gestures towards kids' media are from the past, and they all seem to occupy this space and time that hasn't actually existed for decades. A space and time where kids actually like puppet shows and watch them for entertainment. Those old programs are the model for which the Channel 4 series chooses to style itself as. And that brings us to the first big choice that they made, to differentiate the web series from the TV series. The Don't Hug Me, I'm Scared TV show is, despite itself, an actual kids show. Sometimes. Not in terms of subject matter or anything like that, but in how it presents the narrative of each episode. A typical episode of the web series often felt like it couldn't wait to get to the big turning point, where everything goes scary. And it could feel like the short was putting too much pressure on that one specific moment. This can work for a short video on the internet that's only a few minutes long, but the TV show was going to have to rely on something lasting a lot longer and with a lot more substance. So instead, each episode is shown to be this genuine, earnest attempt at delivering some approximation of a lesson. With the characters first hearing a song, and then getting some examples from their teacher, and then learning through experience from one of those examples. This is exactly what happens on almost every normal, real-world kids show, 
And it's almost exactly what happens on every episode of Don't Hug Me, I'm Scared. It's just that here, the lessons make no sense, the examples are disturbing, and the experience is something akin to sleep paralysis. Still, even with this slight caveat, it is crazy impressive to me that the TV series does manage to have some sort of lessons to teach to its audience. Each episode does end up actually delivering some moral or idea about its topic. For example, take the first episode on jobs. From the outside, it appears to be just following the same tried-and-true DHMIS formula. But looking closer, each stopping point in the individual character's storyline reveals some greater idea that the trio are trying to get across about the horrors of employment. When Red, Yellow, and Duck get transported to the workplace, each of them falls into a role, one of boss, loyal worker, and disgruntled employee. Red becomes an old, out-of-touch curmudgeon who just answers the phone all day and fires people. Yellow gives his life to Petersons and Sons and friends, and just ends up injured on the job and immediately fired for it. And then there's Duck, who, for failing to get with the program like the rest of them, gets sent to therapy and then gets prescribed medication until he's going along unquestionably with what everyone else is doing. That's three clear salient points made about what it's like to have a job, and that's all just from a surface description of the episode's plot. The next episode follows this up again, but instead now we're talking about death. And amazingly, through it all, we do get to see an actual grieving process take place, one that might actually kind of fit a child's understanding of mortality. It really is interesting to watch Yellow try and grasp death as a concept, and what the loss of his friend will mean for him. It really does feel like an encapsulation of how a child would approach the subject without any real guidance. Throughout the episode, we see the mundane realities of losing someone in your life. From the re-emergence of a bunch of cloying relatives you've never met, to the sad emptiness that follows around every space that the departed used to occupy. It all feels like it is really trying to present this understanding of death in the way a normal kid show might. However, in doing so, it also ends up revealing how fucked up that effort might be, like how things turn out when they try to replace Stain Edwards with Duck, in a plot point that feels borrowed from an actual kid show, but with the added realities, and more importantly, consequences, of how fucked up that decision would actually be. Right. Yeah. The third episode on family is, funnily enough, both a cynical takedown of the true value most people see in their family members, and also a pretty succinct rundown on the actual practical reasons you might want to be in a family. The key connective tissue in this episode being how the twins' families and the three friends have this one ultimate goal that's just to get a family-sized meal. Again, this is all wrapped up around a very childlike perspective. Duck's lonely family song points to this, as does Red's rejection of the family he finds. And then there's finally Roy, whose protection of Yellow you could argue also fits into this category. Even if, again, Roy is seemingly only doing this because he's looking for a meal. The family episode can feel the most cynical out of the bunch in that respect, but like the Jobs episode, it feels like DHMIS just isn't relying on absurdity as much as it was before. Now instead, deciding to be more selective and tactful with its nonsense, so it can actually provide some meat for the narrative. Which is why it felt important to me that the episode on Family took the time to return the series to some of its horror roots as well. If nothing else, the twins proved to be an excellent vehicle for delivering these type of old-fashioned scares that the series was used to. And having it all wrapped up in this Texas Chainsaw Massacre homage just makes it all the better. This brings us to the fourth and arguably fan-favorite episode of the series, which is all about friendship. The episode stars clear DHMIS MVP, Warren the Worm, a huge standout amongst the teachers of the new and the old. Mostly for being such a unanimously terrible and detestable presence to anyone who watches the series that he can't not stand out. He's just that bad. His episode has a nice twist on the whole teacher concept, where Warren ends up being such a bad teacher and such a terrible friend that he indirectly teaches a very good lesson about friendship purely by being such a perfect example of the worst possible friend you could ever be. 
Going through that whole episode, he never stops thinking of himself and talking about himself. The other puppets catch on so quick, too, and they just don't fall for it or even pay attention from the start. Calling the computer being there even adds to this sense. It feels like Warren just shows up uninvited trying to usurp his teacher position like Colin did with the globe in the last series. And funnily enough, all of this is being done just so Warren can vomit his insecurities all over the puppets and also maybe con the three of them into buying him a restaurant-style meal. It's just all so stupid. This, coupled with the fact that his manner of teaching is shown through those old sort of VHS PSA presentations on bullying, that would always go on presenting a social situation that has never, ever actually occurred before, is just the cherry on top of this ugly, ugly, gross worm pile. Okay, stop. Everything about the fourth episode works great. And Warren is such a welcome addition to the canon that it feels like the final two episodes of the series had to decide to take a little bit of a backseat from the whole lessons and teacher format. Instead, focusing more on developing the background of the show's story. What little we get from the Choo Choo Man is a quick rundown of the history of transportation and a few short asides about the fossil fuel industry. There's also another little twist here in that the teacher dies midway through his song. And though it's funny, it can't help but feel like another twist teacher on top of the one that we got last episode. The transportation episode is better served by the moments inside the car that speak more to the experience of going on a road trip as a kid and all the various ways it's both a fun and monotonous ride. We see this shown through Yellow and Duck's two very different backseat experiences, but really that's about it for transport. Overall, it's an episode more concerned with developing mysteries than furthering the formula. Electracy's final episode works things back to basics and ends up being a lot more successful overall because of it, I think. There's another small twist here, but I think this one works a lot better, if only for the surprise that it manages to elicit. Instead of dying mid-song or being a total ineffectual prick, Electracy manages to be the only teacher who actually kind of just teaches an uncomplicated lesson about her subject, in this case electricity. She only stops momentarily to execute yellow with an electric chair, and in terms of DHMIS teachers, that's a pretty light sentence. She's nice and informed, and what ends up happening to her is another example of the students turning things on the teachers this time around and inadvertently learning a lesson that way. Tracy doesn't cause the turn in this episode. Duck giving Yellow her batteries and later overloading the circuit breaker is what creates the shift. Yet still, she delivers actual, honest information about electricity and teaches a valuable lesson about what happens when you use too much of it. It's not great, but it's better than any of the other teachers actually manage. Certainly better than the insurance guy did. Thanks for that. The way that the show manages to interweave these actual morals and ideals amidst all this chaos reminded me so much of the work done by PFFR Productions, and that is not a comparison that I make lightly. That studio has been responsible for some of my favorite shows of all time, like the previously mentioned Wonder Showsen and Shivering Truth. But, most notably, they are also the creators of Xavier Renegade Angel. And in a weird way, I feel like DHMIS sits in the exact same ballpark as all of these shows. Wonder Showsen is a pretty fitting comparison to make, as it too was a parody of kids' content designed specifically to feature every possible thing that shouldn't be in a kids' show. If you're a fan of DHMIS, and you haven't seen it or heard of it, I would highly recommend it. But I think the way that Xavier Renegade Angel had this style of presenting this bizarre nonsense plot that contradicts itself a million different times, but still ends up looping back at the end of the episode to make some actual coherent point or express some actual thought, is much more reminiscent of what Don't Hug Me, I'm Scared is actually doing here. And it's not the only comparison that spring to mind. During a second watch of the series, I found myself missing jokes left and right, because they were just brief background gags, or because the pace of the episode was just flying by so fast that I didn't even have time to register it. This was the same case for me when it came to Xavier Renegade Angel, and that's a pretty damn funny show. Gotta... 
The web series never really had a problem making me laugh, but the Channel 4 series is just on a whole other level altogether. So consistently hilarious in a way that you can never possibly anticipate. The work that PFFR does is almost always some of my favorite because you truly cannot tell how one episode of any of their shows is going to end. And that's not something you can really say about most television. Try to guess how the nonsense poem that Xavier begins an episode with is going to end when he finishes it. You can't. It's impossible. And the Don't Hug Me, I'm Scared show is just like this. It's one of the very few shows I've watched that feels truly unpredictable, in that controlled, deliberate, absolutely mental way that Xavier was. Anybody can just film a bunch of random nonsense. Making puppets spaz out next to a bloody sparkle heart is one thing, but carefully orchestrating something so incomprehensible in a way that doesn't actually look carefully orchestrated or incomprehensible seems way, way tougher. Think of how many genuine awkward moments they have to simulate these puppets having and how difficult it must be to make it always seem sincere. I guess we could show which is why it should be noted that this trip into traditional television programming wasn't a trip that the trio made alone. With just a quick look at the credits, you can see how the crew has grown exponentially since their days working on the first short film at Kingston University. There was a plethora of new hires, and some specific animated sequences were even given to outside studios to work on as well. But nowhere has these new voices felt more apparent than in the writer's room. Two new writers came aboard, one in Sam Campbell, an Australian comedian, and also noted TV comedy screenwriter, Megan Gantz. For every episode of the new season, Sam has a full co-writing credit, and Megan has a story editing credit. I'm very familiar with Megan's work on It's Always Sunny in Community and her many, many other shows, and I feel that I can speak pretty confidently to her skills as a comedic screenwriter. But I honestly can't say I've ever heard of Sam Campbell before, or his style of comedy. What I do know is that they both come from much more established backgrounds than Sloane, Terry, or Pelling do. And to my mind, they were likely hired to provide some more grounding for the series. In any case, whatever contributions they did make, whether they be more structural or technical, or perhaps just providing some jokes for a late production draft, I think they did a good job. Don't Hug Me, I'm Scared has a pretty established voice at this point, and new cooks in the kitchen could have mixed all that up. But I gotta say, I never really felt like their introduction changed all that much about how the show feels. The humor that had been set up from the original series wasn't gone. Like many other aspects, it was just being extended, with enough jokes to fill up a whole episode in a manner of pacing that would fit those type of jokes instead. The new crew and the bigger budget didn't do anything to change the general vibe of the series either. It doesn't feel like someone else is calling the shots here. It's still full of non-sequiturs, and it still drops or heightens the tension at a moment's notice. Overall, very little from the web series has changed. What did change, however, was the tone. The tone of the series feels like it's going for something entirely different. Because in its next big departure from the web series, the TV show doesn't go for the same over-present horror style that the original series had. It just isn't something that they want to go for this time. <coughs> what did you say? Speaking in an interview with Metro, Becky Sloan mentioned the difficulties in figuring out the correct tone for the TV series. How there was one scene in particular where Yellow and Red were making a shepherd's pie that they seriously struggled with. When they originally filmed it, it was full of blood and gore. But she didn't like how it looked, and they decided to redo the sequence without the viscera. And it is this version that we see in the show. I think this speaks to mind the idea that they didn't want to just hammer down the same horror button over and over again like they did last time. Filling a scene with random gore doesn't really do all that much to create an actual sense of fear or dread. And Don't Hug Me, I'm Scared has hit the puppet viscera button so many times already, it barely registers anymore. Even if it did have that same impact, the moments of gore aren't really in line with what Sloane, Terry, and Pelling are going for in this series. They are trying to tap into a feeling. That fight-or-flight feeling where you truly don't know how you should respond to something. I think that the trio wisely understood that they couldn't maintain that same level of terror for a full season of television without resulting in diminishing returns. 
Suspense can be built up quickly and effectively, but once the tension breaks and things start getting into an actual threat, you can't go back. That's why jump scares rarely work outside of the precise moment that they occur. Because it's giving the audience a release to the tension, and if the audience isn't tense anymore, then they aren't going to be scared either. For a great Don't Hug Me, I'm Scared episode to work, it needs to maintain this delicate razor's edge balancing act, where things are just strange and creepy enough that you never feel comfortable, but not so strange or creepy that it falls right over itself and gets too obvious to be effectively scary. We are still looking at cute little puppets here. There are just some things that are too direct or too weighty to come across as anything other than a big joke. In its six episodes, the Channel 4 series manages to pull this feat off by using restraint above all else. Like when I watched the first episode on Jobs, I was still having my expectations colored by what I remembered from the web series. I kept waiting for that big moment I've been talking about. The one that shifts the episode from seemingly normal kid show to full-on horror show. I thought we had gotten to it when the Carehound showed up, but he takes a bite out of Duck and then things go back to being seemingly nice. The rest of the episode doesn't have anything close to that outwardly frightening again, and the conflict is resolved in an entirely different way that feels much more appropriately designed for the subject matter of the episode. But it was still odd watching a full-length Don't Hug Me, I'm Scared that didn't have that all-important tone shift that has marked the entire series since the beginning. But this is when I realized that the reason I never experienced that big shift is because this time, it was happening all the time. The structure of the narrative of each episode is not designed to be something you're supposed to feel comfortable in, and so the overall mood of an episode has become a constantly moving target. So now, instead of watching a kid show that gradually becomes wrong, we're watching a kid show that starts off as wrong, and then goes right, and then wrong again, and then a little bit right for a while, and then horribly, horribly wrong again. The Channel 4 episodes are going for something far more unwieldy and erratic. Now, even relying on basic conventions and storytelling tropes can be a crutch because it's something vaguely familiar that the audience might be able to predict. So instead, we're just going balls to the wall crazy town. And the TV show is much more engaging to me because of this fact. The fact that every episode has to have something bigger going for it than just the fear that it elicits. Sometimes the episodes were funny. Sometimes they were gross. Sometimes they were insightful. Sometimes they just felt oddly constructed, like when a miscellaneous line of dialogue suddenly gets this really informal tone. The language is also purposefully obtuse in the smallest and shittiest ways possible. The Don't Hug Me, I'm Scared TV show has this real knack for going back and forth from this very posh, overtly polite demeanor to suddenly the rudest, cruelest things you could ever possibly say to someone else. Hey, come on. It's not your fault. Mm. You're just a f- <sighs> Yeah, you can't help it. You're just a f- Which brings us to the next change that they made from the web series. Now, Red Duck and Yellow are no longer passive participants or unwilling victims. In fact, this time around, they're sometimes the ones who are dishing out the abuse. When Duck in the second episode started actually kind of winning against the coffin, it threw a whole wrench into everything I expected from this show. It's something that I honestly wasn't the biggest fan of when I first saw it, because it felt like allowing the teachers to lose some of their menace and threat also meant that the show was losing some of that dread and all-important claustrophobia that Clay Hill supposedly lacked. But that was because I hadn't seen in practice what the trio were planning on doing with this, and I was still hanging on to the old ideas from the previous series. But like Warren the Worm's episode proves, This effort provides new opportunities for the formula to be tweaked in new and inventive ways, and it usually works out super effectively. In addition to this change, the main three puppets also have much bigger and more expressive personalities than they ever had before. The big winner and clear fan favorite is the talking crow-like thing we call Duck Guy. He had to go through two different series to finally get a personality, but it was all worth it. He comes out the gates in the first episode with his attention freaks, it's me, and immediately stands out as clearly being the best one, like he says just a few seconds into the first episode. I'm the best one. There is just something so naturally selfish 
and casually obnoxious about Duck. You always get the sense that he thinks he's better than everyone and everything around him. And he's another nice addition to the history of undermined ducks who jealously play second fiddle to someone else, a la Daffy or Donald. Red also gets a bit more depth put into him this time around. He was always the one who seemed to have the most personality in the original series, but that was mostly just playing off Joe Pelling's flat vocal performance. Pelling in the Channel 4 series is allowed to give Red Guy a lot more emotions and a lot more range, while still keeping the apathetic core of his character close to his chest. It's interesting seeing how he works in the show compared to the web series, and how his dynamics with the other characters have been altered. He's clearly still the smartest and the most aware out of all of them, but he's also now the one who most easily gets wrapped up in the teacher's lesson, while Duck is usually disinterested or against them from the start, and is because of this always the first one to be expelled. It's like Red being the most aware does nothing to stop him from falling for the teacher's tricks harder than anyone else. He might not actually even be the smartest, he's just bored and sarcastic, and that makes him more challenging to some of the teachers. Lastly, there's Yellow, who still sits firmly in the same spot he held in the original series, as the kid in the room, who is totally clueless to everything that's going on around him. He doesn't get too much of a change from his web series counterpart, at least not until his batteries get switched out, but the show is still more willing to try some new things with Yellow that they weren't willing to do before. I should also mention that Terry Baker voices Yellow and Duck, and he has done an amazing job with both of them here. Losing Duck's synthesized voice and making Yellow more articulate really allowed him to showcase his talent at voicing these characters and how it's grown over the ten years he's been with them. The show this time around also provides a bit more context in regards to the main character's behavior. It was always a bit odd that the three of them never really reacted appropriately to what was happening to them. The show doesn't really change this, but it does seek to explain why these three act so abnormally for people who witness so many horrifying things so frequently. It does this very simply, by making everyone a complete idiot. That's right. More often than not, these puppets are too naive to even understand that they should be afraid of something. They are just so goddamn clueless about goddamn everything. And to me, it's the one final change that shifts everything into place. The last piece of the puzzle that puts the show over the edge. Because though I don't know what or who these puppets are, I do know that they are complete morons. They're tulpas. They're homunculi. They're virgin creatures to the planet Earth who have no preconceptions about the world around them because they were just born. They're like Dougie Jones in the last season of Twin Peaks, stumbling around asking what every single thing is because they don't understand anything. In short, they are all children. Or they at least have the mindset and awareness of a young child. They are exactly the type of real characters that might appear on a normal Sesame Street type show, possessing the exact same understanding of any given topic that Big Bird has when he asks one of the human characters about something. It took me a while to figure out that was the angle that they were going for, but even if you're not aware of it, in practice the decision works out great. I love how the characters keep alternating between being aware of why something is incorrect in one lesson to taking everything a teacher says at face value in another. Like, just the idea that all three of them share a lawyer together and Duck wants to create a digital currency, but none of them have any understanding of the concept of a family or what electricity is is just so fucking funny to me. It's like the trio decided to take the character traits that would be required for a real kid show character, and then treated it completely realistically. In essence, this is what Don't Hug Me, I'm Scared has always been about. The intersection between reality and children's programming, and how those two things are completely incompatible with each other. The more you place the two of them together, the worse they both look in comparison. I love whenever the show steps out from the felt world and enters a real location with real objects and non-felt surfaces, there's just something about watching all these goofy, childlike characters bored and sitting around in that family's shitty, mid-sized apartment that gives off a feeling that no other show really expresses. Wonder Showsen came close in terms of subject matter, Xavier Renegade Angel came close in terms of presentation, and The Shivering Truth came close in terms of how nightmare-inducingly fucked up it is, but there is no other show that really achieves this level of balance 
while also incorporating this many ideas within it, like Don't Hug Me, I'm Scared. Some, like the mixed media elements, are derived from the web series, but regardless of where they come from, they all build together exceptionally well in this TV show. Up to the point where once we got back to the final episodes and the mystery started taking central stage again, I couldn't help but want to go back to the type of episodes from before, if only because I knew that we were getting close to the end of the series. And though the final episodes do take a step back from the traditional formula, much like how the same thing occurred in the web series, I do like the mysteries and ideas in this show a lot more than I did the ones in the previous show. Oh, looks like somebody's having a bad dream. A bad dream. I need to go to sleep now. Good night. This isn't a theory or a lore video, so I won't get into my own ideas of what's going on here, or who's Leslie, or what information the finale was meant to reveal about the whole situation. That's not really what interests me. What I'm more interested in is the shape of the mystery and how Sloane, Terry, and Pelling decided to construct it this time around. It feels far more informed than it did in the web series, where it very much seemed like the trio weren't thinking too much about how this was happening and were instead more focused on why it was happening, always sticking close to the general premise of the series and not building out too much away from it since there wasn't really all that much to begin with anyway. But there feels like a much bigger apparatus in place here, both within and outside the series. That's probably why I enjoyed the strange place the TV show ends on more than I enjoyed the place where the web series ended. The TV show has this cool looping narrative with the last two episodes, and it builds out the basics of the whole Leslie house within a house stuff pretty well. Again, I won't be offering some point-by-point -point explanation, but I will say that the way they are developing the mystery is perfectly befitting for the series. It very much seems like the trio have taken another page out of David Lynch's book and are creating the mysteries of this show in the same way he wanted to create the mysteries of Twin Peaks. Who is Leslie Radeyes and what is her connection to the events of the series? Well, there's a lot of different ideas. Maybe she's Yellow's mom, reliving experiences of their relationship through the world of a TV show. Maybe she's just another puppet like the rest of them, serving some other higher force. The fact that she appears to be half made of felt and plush could lend to this theory. Or maybe she's just literally actress Vivian Suen, and the upper floor of the house is going to turn out to be literally the Don't Hug Me, I'm Scared writer's room for an extremely meta ending. All of these could be true, or not, or only kind of. And the show wisely doesn't do enough to hammer on one specific interpretation, or make it so vague that you might believe that I'm just spouting random nonsense without any purpose behind it. All that surrounds Leslie and the truth of the series feels like it's been set up within the six episodes we got, with just enough dangling to keep the theory hands full. And I think the trio know exactly what they are doing. Like having Leslie say you're not my real son, and then following it up with a chuckle and a oh I'm only kidding, is just deliberately fucking with the people who look for clues in everything that happens in the series. I gotta think it must be exhausting coming up with those types of videos for a TV show that so often takes the piss out of everything. I wish those theorists good luck, because there are many different things we can take from Leslie and the big boys. But for now, I would like to leave that all aside. When the second series does come out, I'm sure a fuller picture will be painted. And I'm going to wait until then to make any predictions or claims about what's actually happening here. But what about my shredder? That is, of course, if a second series does come out. The show was a splash last year when it was released in October, managing to even win Sloan and Pelling a BAFTA for production design. And it's clear that there has been a big slew of support for the project since then, but even with this, the future of Don't Hug Me, I'm Scared's time at Channel 4 isn't so clear as of yet. Thankfully, though, this doesn't appear to be because of some behind-the-scenes corporate fuckery or a global pandemic like last time. In interviews, the trio have discussed the future of the series and have been, as usual, cryptically vague about the whole thing. But from their answers, it's easy to surmise that even if something does go wrong, Red Guy, Duck Guy, and the Yellow Pig aren't going anywhere. The crew is clearly committed to making stories with these puppets, and even if it isn't necessarily going to be a part of the same Channel 4 Don't Hug Me, I'm Scared universe, 
it is still going to be made with all the talent and skill and passion of the same people who made that show. Getting to watch the journey of Becky Sloan, Baker Terry, and Joe Pelling for the past decade has been an actual treasure. There are so few stories in animation, or just in the world of entertainment in general, where things work out and creators get to do the work that they actually want, the work that they are passionate about. And even with a track record as good as Don't Hug Me, I'm Scared's, things can always go wrong, and almost did several times along the journey. But they fucking made it. They got their show, and it was a huge hit, and I am just so happy for them. Which brings me to my final point. I would be remiss if I finished this video without pointing out one very important and often overlooked detail about the Don't Hug Me, I'm Scared franchise, and that is this. The phrase Don't Hug Me, I'm Scared is such a flawless title for what Sloane, Terry, and Joe have been making. It's an odd thing to hear said aloud, but it's incredibly fitting for the series and its subject matter. The title is both somewhat kind and comforting, but also has this odd edge of danger to it. Why are you scared? And why don't you want to be hugged? And why is it that being scared is the reason that you don't want to be hugged? Something you would normally probably desire if you were scared. Why isn't the hug comforting anymore? There's so much about that phrase that alternates from creepy and unnerving to nonsensical and pointless. Frankly, I can't imagine the show possibly being called anything else. Nor could I imagine a world where modern puppetry hasn't been in some way touched by these three wonderful maniacs. I've gone on and on singing their praises, but only because I feel far more people are aware of the Don't Hug Me, I'm Scared brand than they are aware of the people who actually created it. Millions and millions and millions have watched and admired their stuff for over 11 years. The three of them deserve some recognition, and a second series, if nothing else, for all the hard work that they've been putting in. So, as someone who got turned into a fan of yours, from the bottom of my heart, to Becky, Joe, and Baker, don't ever stop getting creative. And thank you all for watching this video. I hope you watch the next one too. Goodbye.